So I probably first heard of Bob in 1967 or 68. But the real story begins much earlier than that, but I didn't know about it until 1980 or 81. So it is as clear and as accurate as honestly as I can tell it. This is what happened. I was sitting in my living room one morning, not thinking about it again, probably drinking coffee, doing, doing something, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, no prompting from me, um, I began having visions, clear 3D visions of some past life experiences. So in one of these, I was a young boy, and I was in a, a military encampment, in sort of an oasis, and there were a lot of horses, camels, baying of animals, and children, women, but lots of men, because it was clearly a military encampment. And I was standing watching this man, surrounded by other men, clearly giving them instructions of some kind. And he made a gesture, looking around as if he wanted water. I was standing near a well, and I pulled up the, the um, bucket, it was a leather pouch full of water. I poured a cup and I ran over and gave it to him. He took the cup and he said, what happened? He went like that, made a gesture, what happened? He says, Mohammed, I was a thief and they caught me and they cut off my hand. He said, I forgive you, don't do it again. He handed me the cup, I went back and that little brief interlude was over. Um, other things happened, but nothing, nothing to do with, with Mohammed or with, with this story. Um, so going back to 67 or so, and I it really, some of the dates, I, I probably could figure it out if I really wanted to, but going back, um, I had seen, I was living in Berkeley, California, and I had uh, seen a poster on how to use LSD better. It's a talk by um, Richard Alpert, who's now Baba Ramdas. I, I think Baba Ramdas is still around. Anyway, um, that's, that's where I was. So anyway, I went to this lecture, and um, in front of, this is a student union at Berkeley, and in front of the student union there was a, a series of tables, and they, they were, some people were behind them, and they were giving out God and appeal pamphlets and um, don't worry, be happy cards. I, I, I um, much to my embarrassment, I looked at the God and appeal pamphlet and promptly threw it away. I kept the don't worry, be happy card. And and d during during this 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 lecture by Albert, um, someone asked him, "Who is who is this Mayor Baba guy?" They're you know they're passing out. And, and Albert, much to my, much to his credit and to my benefit, I, I think it made a difference. He said, "Mayor Bob is the highest spiritual authority around, but he doesn't know about drugs, <laughs> and I'm going to teach him." And this is this is a recorded. You know, everyone's heard that story he's going to teach Baba. So, but, but he did, he gave him high praise, so I kept the card, um, and somehow or another, and it gets, it gets catchy, the, 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 the dates and what actually happened next, but I was, uh, I was at this point a high school dropout, I had been in the Marine Corps for over four years, I had, in my Marine Corps career, had not done, I had, I guess I should tell the truth. I'd been in the brig. 
I had, I had been in a lot of trouble. I, I was in juvenile hall when I was 14 or 15 years old. Um, I was not an exemplary um, citizen, to say the least. Anyway, I was hitchhiking to Santa Fe for no particular reason. And probably on Highway 66, I guess so, um, I got stranded out in front of uh, 29 Palms, Barstow, just hot, hot, blazing heat. I mean, it was like, if you've been out in the desert, <laughs> standing in the desert, no hat, and just cars swishing by, just that sound for hitchhikers and people stood on it, hour after hour after hour, oh my gosh. And somehow the, the thought came to me that um, says, God, I asked God, God, if you will get me out of here, I will try to do something with my life. So I got a ride to Santa Fe, or you know, I got to Albuquerque and went to Santa Fe. And of course, I totally forgot that particular promise to God. Um, hung around Santa Fe, eventually hitchhiked back to Berkeley. I was still using drugs still drinking too much, way too much, um, and had no job, had no discernible skill, um, but I heard they were looking for seamen, so I, I, I got a uh, job on a ship, and um, it, was great, it was a good deal. I, they, I, they flew me to, I think, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, flew me someplace, and I got, a, got on a ship, and we took the ship down the coast through the Panama Canal up to Treasure Island and eventually went to Hawaii. Um, and it was home port in Hawaii and we'd go out and it was an oceanographic survey ship. And it was, you know, pretty 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 nice duty. And I, I don't I don't think I used drugs at all on the on the ship. I, I don't I, I don't remember it. Um, so anyway I spent six months there and I kept the bottle car. I I remember it was, it was, I, there was two people in this forecastle. I had the lower bunk, and I, I taped the card right above my head, don't worry, be happy card. And I remember writing on the wall or next to it or something, a line from a poem I'd seen, when, sh when shall we set sail for happiness? So I saw this card every day. Never, never once, never once, like, thought about who he was or any, and no, uh, that's all gone. But eventually I did pin the card on the forecastle wall where, where people could see it coming and going, and people would ask me, hey, man, who's that? And I said, ah, some crazy guy, I think he's God. Oh, okay. And no one, no one ever, no one ever took it down, no one marked it up. I, I just, but I saw it every day, saw it every day. And um, eventually got off that ship, went back to Berkeley, kept doing the same stupid stuff. Um, however, I did, I guess I did have some, some desire to find out more about Baba because I, I found my way over to the Sufi Center on Sutter Street in San Francisco and I bought a, a book, um, Beams from Mare Baba. And um, that and, oddly enough, The Republic by Plato, I took those, I, I got another ship and I took those two books with me. This time they flew me to the Okinawa and I got a ship, it was a transport ship. And, and we, we basically were taking equipment, um, weapons, mops, rooms, anything that the military needed in Vietnam, um, we, we would take it. And, and so we'd go to Thailand, pick something up, and, you know, and then go to Japan, go here, go there, go to Vietnam. Um, and I did the same thing. I took the card and pasted it up. People kept asking me the same question. Eh, it's so crazy guy thinks he's God. But, but I, did have, I did have beams. And um, on this particular ship, I had a job. Um, called a watch standard. So I had to be awake and standing watch it between four and eight. Four and eight in the afternoon, four in the evening, four and eight in the morning. And, and, and it was so lovely, so lovely. The sun coming up every day, going down. 
and just sailing through this balmy seas, you know, sometimes huge storms and stuff, but basically it was pretty, pretty, pretty nice. And we'd go up in, into this, uh, Vietnam a lot, and since I'd been in the military, I felt comfortable with all this stuff, and I'd sometimes just jump on a truck and go up into the up, up country. Um, and, and what I did with, with beams is I would try to read a line or two, um, and then when I was on watch, I would try to remember what I read and think about it, which was a very difficult process for me because I really had, I'd been drinking heavily ever since I was a, a young boy and using drugs. And so, so it was very difficult for me to remember much of anything, but I did try, I gave it a try. Um, Anyway, um, I was in I was in Saigon during the Tet Offensive, and um, I, I, I still I would realize that years I mean it, it must 20, 20, 30 years must have gone by before I realized how close I had come because the the the, uh, the Viet Cong were there, and a barmaid snuck me out of the bar and and got in the back and we snuck out and. So somehow I escaped being captured. It's, I mean, it was, I'm probably very close. I still feel very fortunate and, and thankful for this this young girl, one woman, whatever. Um, anyway, eventually got off that ship. Um, had the Baba card. Had the had this stuff. Um, still hadn't made any real investigation of personally who who Mayor Baba was in my own life. Um, Got off that ship and went back to Berkeley, and um, a friend of mine, who many people know, Ed Van Buskirk, um, had found a inexpensive macrobiotic cafe that he could purchase, but he didn't have any money. But I had money because I had been. It was a high, you know, for for me, relatively speaking, it was a high paying. It was a union job. I, I had lots of money, so so we bought the restaurant. I probably fronted most of the money. Um, and and Ed, I think, was already, anyway, he was probably a Baba lover already, I don't know. So there's lots of Baba posters on all the walls, and, um, and a lot of people came by. Every, every, every Baba person in the Bay Area seemed to stop by. Every uh, People whom I still know, still like um, Alan Talbot, Rick Chapman, Robert Dreyfus, who, who we became good friends, Mick and um, Uchi, uh, Hamilton, um, scads of people would, would come by this macrobiotic cafe. Um, and um, this, this clearly must have been 69 because, because they had announced the great Darjean. I, at this point, still, I would go to meetings, I still had no I had no knowledgeable personal connection with Mirabai. I could not admit that Baba was God. The whole idea is, it just was, I just couldn't do it. I, I, did, I didn't, I wasn't hypocritical. I just could not say that Baba was God. It just, that's it's just, it's just so, so outlandish. Um, but, but I'd heard that there was this Darshan and people were going to go, eh, okay, I'll go. I had, again, I still had money. So, um, um, and then Baba dropped the body, and, and uh, you know I was I was I was certainly dismayed, like other people, even without any real feeling that, that Baba was my master, or, or I was. So anyway, um, I had somehow managed at this point to go back to a junior college, um, trying to. I realized I couldn't. I couldn't always be doing nothing or, or trying to do a macrobiotic cafe when I didn't know anything about it. So anyway, I'd gone back to college and and ran into a, a woman there who was a Baba lover, and and, uh, and she told me, you know, if you want to go to Darshan, they got one seat left, one seat left, and said, oh. So I phoned the Sufi Center, and that, that they they were the ones who were arranging the flight. So I went to. Uh, I got I got the uh, I got the last seat, and duly set off to India. Um, 
quite frankly, I did not have a good time. I, there was no, there, there was, there was, there was some interesting. One, one of the strongest remembrances I have is is asking Audie, okay, Ronnie, like, what's just give me the simple story. What 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 does Baba want of people? And you know, I don't know if you knew him or people who knew him. He had these very intense eyes. He, he, what, he didn't give me any snap, little cute answer. He really looked at me and finally said, be kind to others. And it really is like, that stuck with me as much as anything. And you know, there was a couple, there was an incident or so with Muhammad and stuff. And, but, but basically, I, I felt very out of it. I felt I, I didn't feel connected, even though I didn't know some of these people now since they'd been coming by the restaurant. But but I still felt very inadequate in terms of everyone, of course, was a college graduate or a PhD and professor. So, I mean, it's just, it's, I felt very out of it, being this 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 dropout and sort of ne'er do well. Um, but no one ever treated me that way. That's just my own my own being, no one doing. Um, so we went to. Uh, yeah, I went, went to Baba John's tomb and I went to Baba's house and all this stuff. Um, and again, I didn't, I didn't, and, and I, I do remember Erich standing up in front of um, the crowd who had come to um, uh, wherever, Gurbasad, um, saying, you have kept your appointment with God, um, but I still couldn't. You know, I still didn't have any real connection, or I didn't have any intellectual conviction. Um, so, and Francis's speech. I mean, there was certainly memorable things, but nothing, nothing really, really. No great mystical experience or anything. Um, and came back to, um, you know, the flight ended and we all went back to Berkeley and I kept doing what I was doing. Um, um, and I, I, I think a good, a good year must have gone by or so. Um, and I would still go to meetings. It was it was a it was a curious group. There's still there's a lot of people from Berkeley who became Baba lovers and who go to these meetings. We would we would we'd sit around and drink beer until until the, the meeting started. I mean this is how I remember it. We, we'd be there's a pool hall down below and a, a beer hall up above and and it wasn't it wasn't drunkenness. It was just you know, it was just these guys young guys mostly. Uh, and then we go to the Baba meetings, and, and uh, many of them are, are still Baba lovers. Um, and I still didn't, never, you know, I, I would go to the meetings, there, were, there was movies, go to the Sufi Center, um, but never, never, never really got to me. Um, then one morning, I, I decided I was going to go play pool, you know, and I think the pool all opened at 10 o'clock and I got there early, 9.45 or something like that. And I was sitting in the car waiting for the pool hall to open and um, I finally did what I should have been doing all along. I asked myself a question. What, what happened to you in India? I asked myself, what happened to you in India? And within a millisecond, the minute I asked the question, the answer came. It's the first time in my life I'd ever felt love. And, and that's when I say that I became a Baba lover. At that moment, I, I, it wasn't that I had doubts, I just didn't have any consciousness of it. And then that's when I, you know, accepted it. It might have been 70, 71, I don't know. Um, and it's now a couple of years later. <laughs> and here I am. So, 
How does how do you relate to Baba in your life now? I try to remember Baba. I try to think about him, and I do. And and I try to meditate. I mean, but I, I don't do any of these things consistently. But yes, I get up in the morning, I think about Baba. I go to sleep, I think about Baba. I walk around, I think about Baba. Or his name comes to me, and I say his name. And and sometimes I try to sit in meditation and meditate on his picture. And then I've gone to India a number of times, and and then met the Mandali, and then uh, up here. And, um, so, so it's, it's a much more alive, it's alive for me.